feel the disease closing in on me. All my activities are life and death. Keep up my blue cross, up my reps, eat my vegetables. <laughs> Sometimes I'm so frightened, I go back on my resolutions. I drink too much, I smoke a joint, and I find myself in the bars, in the clubs, where I stand around and watch. I'm very frightened, and I miss you. Well, say something, damn it. I have it. What? You have what? He has AIDS. I don't think that's funny. The idea is ridiculous. Well, that's the bad news. You ran the damn marathon. Darling. The good news is I have only the swollen glands. We call it a pre-AIDS condition. AIDS-related complex. And I've lost some weight. I'm in a state of shock. Move in with me. Chet doesn't know how to take care of you. I tire easily. My temperature goes up and down. Your suppressor cells outnumber your helper cells. I don't care what he has, Betty. He's my brother. You're my lover. You're my buddy. There was a woman who was told by her doctor that she had cancer and had two months to live. Now, wait a minute, she told the doctor. I'll be wanting a second opinion. To which the doctor replied, okay, you're ugly too. <laughs> David told me that one. He was an old Jewish man who had survived the Lotz Ghetto in World War II. He'd seen everything in his life. But when his time came to go, he accepted it. I loved him. But most of my people are more like Margaret. She was in her 90s. She half accepted the fact that she was dying. One moment, she'd be telling you which nephew she was definitely going to cut out of her will. And the next, she'd be telling you about the summer vacation she was planning to take in Skibbering. She had terminal cancer. But I always go along with whatever they have to say. My job is not to bring enlightenment, only comfort. Welcome to Conversation. Lehman College's series of discussions with the major artists of our time. Our guest today for the first of a two-part chat is me. And for this very special edition of Conversation, where we turn the tables and put the shoe on the other foot, I will be interviewing William Hoffman. Hi, I'm Jerry Bernard, the producer of Conversations, and usually I'm behind the scenes. We thought that our audience deserved to know more about the wonderful and talented playwright, librettist, screenwriter, director, and teacher who was also the star of this show, William Hoffman. So, Bill, welcome to your own personal edition of This Is Your Life. I don't know if I can talk on this side of the table. <laughs> well, it's a little strange for both of us, but we'll have to debate afterwards who's more nervous. Uh, the opening clip that the audience just saw was from what is arguably one of your most famous works, the play As Is. Recently, an article appeared in uh, the New York Magazine that's called uh, As Is, one of the seminal plays of the 1980s. Can you tell us a little bit about how it came about and when you wrote it? Well, I, I, I started writing the play uh, when I first read about this mysterious new disease uh, that was seemed to be afflicting gay men on Fire Island, and uh, and I thought it was a joke. I thought it was the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I I couldn't figure out how a disease could distinguish between who was gay and who was straight. And uh, then this joke turned into this nightmare. And uh, so I started writing the play before there was a word AIDS. And uh, and I, when my friends started to die in droves, I uh, felt impelled to talk about it, especially since uh, the major media were not talking about it. The New York Times didn't think it was proper to talk about anything having to do with homosexuals. As a matter of fact, it took the New York Times a long time to even mention the word gay on their front page. Right. Um, well, we all remember, some of us certainly remember that time, and certainly a lot of us have lost a lot of people to that time. But it was interesting to me that we recently saw a production of it again, as is, at City College, and um, it's still 
valid in many ways. E in as it hasn't changed all that much in all this time. Certainly, treatments are better and hope is, is greater, but not all that much has changed. We've known each other now ever since you started working at Lehman. It's about and six years. Which yeah. is about six years and feels like decades, <laughs> I don't know. But we have known each other for what seems a long time. But my connection with you goes back longer than that. First of all, I knew right away that um, before you came here, I was in a production of As Is at on Lehman's, in Lehman Stages, uh, directed by uh, Bing Bill. And um, I w just remembering thinking how incredibly wonderful the play was and how wonderfully it was written because there's so much pathos and there's so much heartbreak in it, yet there's so much humor and outrageousness at the same time. Um, and I've noticed that in a lot of your other works as well. Would you like to comment on that? Uh, I'm not sure I know how to comment on it. It's just the way I see things. I, I, uh, uh, I like to laugh, and I prefer comedy to anything else. And, uh, but I often write about tragic things, so I, I, so I, I guess I approach even tragic things uh, with some comedy, I if warranted. Uh, I, it's not like I'm looking for comedy or looking for tragedy. That's just the way I am. Well, it's, it's funny, outri uh, outright funny, and it also has a lot of black humor in it as right. well, which, of course, we are very familiar with. Um, now, further back in our lives, it seems we were also destined to not meet or we both grew up in the same part of New York. We both grew Inwood. up in Inwood and Washington Heights area. My mother had a costume jewelry shop on Dykeman Street. And my father had the hardware store on Dykeman That's Street. So odd. <laughs> so That's so odd. You see? It's all funny in the end. Um, so would you tell us a little bit about your family background and their history? Because a lot of it has played into things right. you've written. I, uh, my, my family were, uh, my mother and father were both born in Europe. Uh, my father was born in uh, in Poland, but at that time Poland was part of that part of Poland was part of the Russian Empire, in the legendary town of Białystok. My mother was born in the Latvian part of the Russian Empire. Uh, she was born in a town called Libau uh, or Liepaja in Latvian, and uh, and so they they met in in Liepaja actually. Uh, my 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 father was uh, my my uncle was dating my mother, and he jilted her, and so he handed her over to my mother. <laughs> uh, it, it was this sordid family tale. Anyway, my parents met, and uh, he swooped her off to America. And your parents have a bit of a, th a theatrical background, right? My father, uh, uh, we have a picture somewhere of my father in a play called The Prisoner in Bialystok in, God, I don't know what year, really early, he played The, the Prisoner. And uh, I have the program from that, uh, from that uh, uh, show. Uh, he never told me that when he was alive. I just <laughs> found it in his, in his belongings. And he was involved in a theater group. His brother was a, a Yiddish poet and playwright and uh, who worked uh, for the Folksbiener, which uh, performs all over town still. And uh, he wrote shows for them and for the legendary Molly Pecan and Ben Bonus. And uh, so, uh, and my mother was involved in movies in Berlin. She had moved to Berlin from Latvia. And uh, uh, she, uh, they wanted her to, uh, to be in movies, and, uh, but her family forbade her. They were Orthodox Jews, and they thought that was tantamount to becoming a prostitute. <laughs> well, sometimes they used to consider actors and <laughs> prostitutes not very far apart. And my uncle, uh, that same uncle, uh, appears in a movie which I've been trying to get a hold of. Maybe one of our viewers will know where to find it. It's called, it was a German movie uh, called Gassenjunge von Paris, Street Children of Paris. And I, I've not been able to find that movie. I would give anything to see my uncle in the year 1920 or 22 or whatever it is. We'll have to go delving through the archive. very glamorous figure. Yes. yes. Um, well, let's segue into a later part of your life then, where, which is your, uh, you w went to college, you, um, at City College? 
Uh, yes, I majored in Latin. Right, and you had no drive to be a writer at that time. None. I was uh, not really. Uh, I, I wrote poetry. I, I, I didn't go to the theater. It bored me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I was not stage struck in any way. Uh, I preferred television. I, I liked... Uh, I, I was fascinated with, uh, with Latin and, and foreign languages. I, I studied all the number of languages. And then you got involved in what became the off-off Broadway scene, which uh, w included Cafe Chino and La Mama and uh, right. and things. We have some photo montage of photos uh, we're going to show. W uh, you can comment about them as we go by, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit more about okay. it. Uh, that's the outside of the Cafe Chino on Cornelia Street. Uh, it's now a restaurant. Uh, uh, this is the inside, is decorated by Kenny Burgess and, and uh, uh, Joe Chino. The, uh, uh, Joe Chino, of course, owned it. That's Joe Chino and the great playwright Edward Albee. Uh, Albee was a frequent uh, visitor to the Chino. That is uh, Doric Wilson, who runs a theater called Tassos to this day, a uh, playwright, a very good playwright. And my God, there are a lot of people. Uh, Lanford Wilson is down there, Leonard Melty. My God, it's whizzing by. That's the off-off-Broadway star Helen Half with Steve something or other. And this is, of all people, Harvey Milk and, uh, uh, and Tom, Tom O'Morgan, Tom O'Morgan. A memorial service I went to last night. He just passed away. Uh, oh, why, that's Tom Ian who wrote uh, Dream Girls. And this is Lanford Wilson, uh, Marshall Mason, and Clarice, Clarice Nelson. Oh, Bernadette Peters, who's... Uh, starred in Dames at Sea at the Cafe Chino on a tabletop sized stage. And this is Doric and someone I, who I don't have no idea who that is. And that's me. And that's uh, Bill. As a director of a play called X's, which was really a pattern of X's like. And that's me again with a mustache. God, I, that was an awful mustache. And, and of course, oh, I had me to include too. this picture. Can you believe that? <laughs> That well, you would put we were, hip we were hippies My in God. those days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That was uh, uh, um, uh, my friend uh, Lucy Silve. Right, uh, yes. On the I was the one on the right. You were the one on the right. Are we <laughs> sure about that? Yes. <laughs> and um, that was on Samuel Barber's estate, estate yes. actually, where that was taken. Yes, it was. So it was a whole host of very interesting people running yes. around the, the composer, the great Pulitzer Prize winning composer, composer. Samuel Barber's. Estate. Uh, we had a whole show on uh, the off-off Broadway scene. And we, we interviewed Lanford. We interviewed Lanford Wilson. We uh, interviewed Edward Albee. Right. We've had uh, Marshall Mason on. So they, these people continue to be well-known, very productive, important and very people. important people, all who started out in these, in these days. Uh, Edward Albee didn't start out in those days. He preceded these days. Right. Uh, but uh, he was involved in that he... He produced plays th that were from the Chino sometimes, and he was a very generous colleague. He was terrific. Everybody has always is. said so, yes. Yeah, yes. still is. So, and then you got involved with uh, Circle Repertory. Right, which was uh, uh, founded by uh, uh, Marshall Mason and Lanford Wilson, and among others. And, uh, uh, and I, I, I had been involved in other off-off-Broadway stuff, and then I joined them. And uh, eventually, they did my play as is. And that was the start of it all for you, really, at that point. Do you have any idea how many productions of as is has, have gone up? Not a clue, but uh, there were, I don't know. And it's been 30, translated 40, into a lot of languages. 12 different languages. There, there, there were many innumerable productions in this country. and. Um, yeah, it's been all over the place. Yeah, I must say that uh, uh, although I loved working at Circle Rep, that really wasn't the start of my career. The Cafe Chino was, right. and uh, uh, and uh, and La Mama. I uh, I was de if it weren't for the Chino, uh, especially, I never would have written plays. I had no interest in plays. And uh, so that was where you got your first encouragement. Yes, I I didn't know I was a playwright. Uh, I was I only started writing plays because. My friends were writing plays, and I was jealous of the applause. <laughs> that was it. And uh, then I found that I had uh, 
um, I, I could write them, and uh, it was a very tentative thing for a long time because I, it, it didn't appeal to me. And most, uh, most, um, I have to say that um, I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm not the fan type. I, 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 I like to write for certain things, and uh, and um, and it's hard for me to write. And uh, uh, but I, I didn't. It wasn't a natural thing. To those of us on the outside, it seems very natural to you now, at least. Um, one of the other photos which I had meant to include was a picture of you as uh, Bill Hoffman, the actor, in The Haunted Host. I looked like that for one minute. Uh, <laughs> Marshall, had, uh, uh, Marshall Mason had directed me in uh, Robert Patrick's play, The Haunted Host, and Robert and I uh, starred in it. It was the first, very first production, and uh, uh, it was the most glamorous shot I've ever taken, and <laughs> I'm very proud of it, and Robert is very proud of it. It really made it look like young gods. And you're still using it for your headshot. <laughs> yes, it's, just, it's the greatest picture, and, uh, uh, but I never really quite looked like <laughs> before or know. after. <laughs> there were quite a lot of very good-looking people around in those yeah. days, yes. Um, that play was later starred uh, uh, Harvey Firestein uh, in, Lance in uh, Robert Patrick's role. And uh, so it's been around the block a few times. Yes, and I think, uh, I, think I found a photo of that also which said uh, that it was Harvey Firestein's first male role. That's right. Th <laughs> that he had played. So, <laughs> so it was rather interesting. Yes, there's a lot of history here. There were pictures of... Al Pacino and everybody yeah. who came out of that early those early days, yeah. which is fascinating to me. Bette You're Midler as well. Bette Midler, yes, of course. But speaking of your heritage in, in getting involved in the, uh, the some of the plays you r write and uh, where you came from and your background, uh, we have a clip I'd like to show from your play Riga. Yes. Want to tell us about Riga a little bit? Well, uh, Riga it was a, a play I worked on a long time at the... Uh, uh, at the uh, circle rep, and it's uh, I called it I call it just your normal gay interracial Holocaust play, <laughs> and that's the subtitle of it. And it's a uh, a savage but funny play, I hope, and uh, um, and it's about the uh, it's about a love affair uh, between a, a a man obsessed with the Holocaust and his black lover who is obsessed with not. Uh, escaping from his family in South Central, and uh, the two of them are lovers, and they fight like cats and dogs, and uh, and it, it it includes a reliving of both their pasts, uh, and it's horrendous and funny, and uh, I hope touching. I think it is very much so, and you even included it in uh, a vaudeville skit as oh. well, which was very funny uh, mm -hmm. part of it. Uh, so let's roll that clip of Riga.
obviously that was a um, handheld camera right. recording of it. Where did that take place? And uh, that was uh, a production in Los Angeles, uh, uh, directed by Marshall W. Mason, and uh, uh, and uh, in I forget Venture West Company produced it. And I, I remember you saying you were very pleased with the at the lead actor in that, Joe Poland. Jo yes, yeah. yes. And uh, h how about the rest of the production? It, it was it was very strong. It was a very strong production. Um, I've uh, I've wanted to see it done elsewhere, but so far we haven't done it elsewhere. It's a it's a rough play. Uh, it is rough considering the subject matters it deals with, and the lead character is um, has a lot of anger. I think. Yes, they they both are. They're both uh, both lead characters are are really enraged. The uh, 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 the the lover. Uh, uh, who I call uh, uh, Y uh, is uh, he's angry at his family. His brother is on trial for murder, and his family has abandoned him because he's gay. And uh, so the, uh, uh, the the these two people come together, and it's they're they're in love, but they can't get along. And uh, and so at the at the end they finally do have a modus vivendi, but it's a very rough kind of uh, getting together. All this time, of course, you were writing other plays and other uh, things were right. being done. I I glanced at your curriculum vitae for the college. If it was about twenty eight pages long, right. <laughs> I think you've been very prolific. Yes. Yes. Nothing like a lot having uh, done spent a lot of time writing. I spent a lot of time writing plays and and then opera, and uh, uh, so it's been a busy time. Yes. Yes. Well, that's the next subject I wanted to get into, which was um, your plays that you you've written plays with music, you've written plays uh, that were uh, operas, and you've written uh, a couple of other things. In a little while, we're going to see a clip uh, of, of uh, we're not going to see a clip, I'm sorry. We're going to hear some music from the Cows of Apollo. Now, this you called a mask. Right. So could you describe what that is and what this is about? Well, uh, a mask is an Elizabethan form that combines music, dance, uh, acting, and uh, it's, uh, it's similar to an opera, but uh, uh, it usually involves uh, dance, and I, I based it on a. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Sophocles also wrote uh, comedies. The Great Tragedian was also considered in his own time a great comic writer because the tragedians were re were required to add a comedy to their trilogy, and uh, uh, and so Sophocles we have one and a half pieces of. Uh, of of these comedies uh, left extant, and uh, the one half of one is a, um, a play called *The Searchers* by Sophocles, which is about the invention of music. And I took this fragment of a play and turned it into *The Cows of Apollo*. And I, I have never had so much fun working on the piece, and uh, and it's all about how uh, 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 this uh, the cows of Apollo. Uh, the golden cows of Apollo are stolen and uh, and turned into the first musical instrument, a lyre, L-Y-R-E. And uh, eventually that turns into the first musical piece. And we combine the composer and I, Chris Theophanides, uh, uh, created this uh, rather wacky but I think wonderful piece. Uh, I love the piece. I hope it's done more. And... Um, and in the at the height of it all, we introduced rock and roll as the first musical piece, which eventually uh, Apollo turns into a classical piece with a triumphant ending about the triumph about of art. And, and then we have to wait three thousand more years for rock and roll, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> because <laughs> Apollo just decided it wasn't time yet. Yes. <laughs> well, I must say that I listened to the uh, recording of it. And the score is absolutely lush and wonderful. Yes, it's a, it's a rich thing. Yes. 
Well, we are coming to a close for this first part of this conversation. Oh my God. Time just keeps going. Yeah. And uh, so now we would like to play this music as we go out from the cows of Apollo. And I'd like to thank you, Bill, and our home and studio audience for joining us and to please join us for this very special second part of Conversations with William M. Hoffman, where the conversation is with William M. Hoffman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.